this next one, this next one, uh, what I, the story I told, not even at John's expense, he was doing his job appropriately. It was true in that I, I worked very hard on an initial piece. I submitted it to John, and he very graciously uh, declined because they didn't do childhood memoirs in that page. And I was a little sad about it, but you know, uh, a few weeks later, I had an unpleasant experience. Uh, came home and said, how can I turn this unpleasant experience into a positive one? So I sat down, wrote it up in about two hours, sent it to John, it was in the New York Times Magazine. And that's how this all began, and that is this piece. It's called, He Goes Down Looking. The guy in front of us at the White Sox versus Red Sox game was standing up. The people in front of him were sitting. The people two rows behind him, sufficiently elevated in the stands, were sitting. Thus, he was blocking the view of one person, the person in the seat directly behind him, my wife Beth. She activated her considerable blonde charm and asked him to sit down. The guy smiled at her, his reflective sport sunglasses, giving him a bug-like bien. Are you kidding? He snapped. With bulk and air go up, one out, the base is loaded, sit down. You should be standing up. He turned back to the game, remaining both upright and opaque. On the other side sat my eight-year-old daughter, Rose. Would she someday write an autobiographical play in which my failure to insist that the guy sit down take on the most mythic resonance, the same mythic resonance as Willie Loman's woman from Boston? Mama couldn't see, Papa! She would shout in the climactic scene. Paul Kanerka was up and she couldn't see! And you didn't do anything! We're talking baseball, a little bit overdramatic. Talking baseball, but it sets up the Concentrating on her journal, writing down rhyming titles for her projected series of historical adventure novels, Wacky Jackie, in which her characters go back in time and play ball with Jackie Robinson. Polkinerko popped out. The guy sat down deflated. Beth tapped him on the shoulder and said, with a big smile, well, that was worth standing up for, wasn't it? disarming smile in the world. My daughters, happily, have inherited it, and I am encouraging them to pursue careers that will make full use of that gift, like talking elderly people out of their savings. <laughs> the guy turned around, considered Beth's charming smile and merry blue-green eyes, and let loose with a lengthy and considered obscenity in the form of a suggestion. Now, as a lifestyle, Spending your time drowning in self-recrimination for your lack of action has its drawbacks, but it does prepare you for the rare occasion when a chance to try again presents itself. I reposted it with a similar obscenity, with the pronouns and tenses artfully switched around, so that now the unprintable suggestion applied to him. And so many had thought my Harvard BA in English literature had been wasted. <laughs> Choose from among the many empty seats in our section, all of them far enough away to stand without bothering us. He glared at me, I assume, from behind his mirrored lenses. I've had these seats for 12 years, he said. How long have you had yours? Truthfully, about two hours. I felt silent, which is just one more indication that I was wise not to pursue a career as a cage match fighter. Would you please just turn around and we can go back to having a good time, Beth asked. I'm having a great time, he said. Let's chat, let's have a good talk, or anything else you want to do. My daughter was carefully writing down The Night Before the Light, her title for a novel about the invention of a light bulb. But this was a confrontation. I had to do something. Surprisingly, for a person who does radio, I opted for visual comedy. I leaned in and used his reflective, his reflective lenses as a mirror. Hang on a second, I said. I want to arrange my hair. We're talking baseball. 
demonstration of the previously suggested transformation. I did the cue too early last time. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> now. <laughs> can I get, can I get, uh, maybe I can get Mike for a minute. No, I'll never get right. the moment. You may have noticed I have very little hair. In retrospect, I believe I was making his attribute subservient to my own utility, a gesture akin to wiping my nose on his shirt. And by invoking an imaginary need to do so to reinvoke the metaphor, it was akin to wiping my nose on his shirt when I had no nose to begin with. <laughs> uh, calculated, or rather calculate now, as I tried to justify a completely pathetic gesture, I'd be adding a nice frisson of additional humiliation. shot back. Aha! I had reduced him to the level of ball of jokes. There was some satisfaction in that. Some very, very little satisfaction. The guy and I stared at each other. At least I stared at him behind his glasses. He might have been weeping. I really don't know. Beth leaned forward and said, would you please, please just turn around? The guy took a second to contemplate his wide range of possible actions. Then he turned around. Beth had diffused the situation by simply giving him the out of appearing gracious. I was, as I often am, amazed and gratified by her wisdom and restraint. Then she said to me, in a full and clear voice, <laughs> Peter, don't let him bother you. He's just a tiny, tiny man who needs to pick fights in order to feel better about his awful, sad little life. shoot us. <laughs> he did nothing. We enjoyed the rest of the game, which the White Sox went on to lose. Rose never noticed a thing, busy as she was with inventing the title Crazy Cannons. She told me it would be a story about how her heroes help avoid a war by making everyone laugh. I hope they don't pretend to comb their hair using the other guy's sunglasses. It doesn't work. <laughs> Making her cruise debut. 